should work for us. Okay, great. So, a lot of really interesting research going on on a number of different levels. Um, quite a bit of diverse research. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, a project that has been ongoing for uh, a few years now and is in its final stages. This is the lifecycle management of ETDs project. Um, as Gail mentioned in the intro, um, my work is primarily geared towards, I'm Matt Schultz, um, my, gear is pri my work is primarily geared towards program management uh, for the Meta Archive Cooperative. Um, Meta Archive is one of the, the first, if not the first, um, international digital preservation network. Um, the Meta Archive is really a community of libraries and archives and uh, research centers that are cooperatively <coughs> preserving each other's digital collections. Um, we've been, we have uh, several members who are here in the audience today, um, and ETDs have uh, for quite some time been a, a very big priority for uh, the Meta Archive membership. Um, it's been a, a real pleasure for me to have the chance to work as a project manager, uh, and it, in addition to my program management with Meta Archive on, uh, on this project. It's a bit of kind of an extension of uh, the work that we do in common uh, in Meta Archive to make some advances in, uh, in digital preservation. So I want to start by uh, thanking our grant funder. Uh, the Institute of Museum and Library Services has made it possible uh, for me to come here and share a little bit about this project. Um, this being an international conference and this grant being a largely US uh, focused set of research, um, that opportunity is hugely appreciated. Um, I also want to thank the, uh, take a moment to thank the NBLTD, um, who's been our project partner on this grant and has been a strong advocate and collaborator uh, for our research and, and our various deliverables under the project. So a little bit about the life cycle uh, management of ETD's project. Uh, this project ac actually goes back uh, a few years now. Um, it has its start, um, oddly enough, in some very strategic conversations by the NDLTD board. Um, this was back, I believe, in maybe 2009, 2010. Um, the NDLTD partners with Meta Archive. Uh, we share several of our members in common. Um, and as I mentioned, ETDs have been an important uh, focus of our preservation work in, in, uh, in our community. Um, Meta Archive carried out along with the NDLTD um, and s some of our joint members such as uh, uh, Virginia Tech, some of the first community surveys on uh, ETDs and I think these surveys in particular helped to kind of light a bit of a fire um, under the need for this project. Um, essentially the thrust of the project is to uh, promote best curatorial practices and to increase the capacity of academic libraries to reliably preserve. ETDs, we've got several different deliverables that I'll talk a little bit about in just a second. Um, a set of guidance documents for the lifecycle management of ETDs, a suite of uh, lifecycle management <coughs> tools, and a workshop to uh, provide some instructional information about each of those, uh, those two first deliverables. <laughs> So these are our project partners, um, really impressive set of preservationists, uh, curators, and in some cases even deans of libraries. Um, these experts have uh, directly shaped our deliverables, they're the authors of the guidance documents, um, they've guided some of the directions that we've taken with some of our technology development in the project. Um, Gail McMillan uh, in particular has been there for each of the workshops uh, that I've delivered and has helped to uh, process and synthesize some of the feedback that we've gotten on the workshop surveys that we've delivered. Um, the community has really benefited from the hard work of these, uh, these individuals in the context of this project. <clears throat> so first up, uh, talk a little bit about our first deliverable. Um, you know, as I said, each of the individuals that you just saw listed on the, the previous slide there um, have set aside really copious amounts of their uh, time to research and document various areas of what we consider to be life cycle management uh, for ETDs. You can see, hopefully you can see, uh, a number of the great different you know, topics that uh, we've addressed over the course of the, um, the project. Um, these documents have undergone several rounds of community review and feedback. Um, we may have heard from you know, some of you in the audience over the course of the evaluations uh, on previous drafts of the documents as they've uh, headed into their final form. Um, they are in their final form now and they are freely available on the NDLTD uh, website as well uh, as on the Educopia Institute web website. 
Um, Educopia Institute is the nonprofit host administration for the Meta Archive Cooperative. <laughs> so you can go to either of the two URLs at the bottom of the slide here, um, and I'm sure the slides will be made available after the, um, the conference and access the materials there. So in addition to the guidance documents, um, ETD programs, uh, we feel, need some practical tools to begin responsibly managing ETDs um, and, and ETD submissions for the long term. Um, this project has researched and documented and produced uh, a variety of different tools to make it a bit easier to do so. So um, up at the top there, you're seeing a uh, mention of virus checking. We feel this is extremely important for uh, ETD programs to start to engage in at the front end of the process of accepting an ETD submission. Um, we are providing some instructions for using one of the most widely used uh, open source uh, virus detecting pieces of software, CLAM AB. Um, we, uh, for file format identification, uh, this also uh, is something that, particularly with the increasing interest and focus that we're seeing um, on supplemental content, um, things uh, like complex objects, multimedia files, um, we are documenting a range of different open source tools that are quite easy to, uh, to download, install, and, and begin making use of for uh, generating some technical metadata around these sorts of submissions that can continue onward from uh, the point of submission to the institutional repository. So gathering a bit of that information up front at the point of submission uh, before uh, a student author has uh, exited and uh, that person is no longer around to resubmit uh, a particular uh, file format if it proves to be problematic for the institution's policies or workflows. Uh, in the area of preservation metadata, we're trying to make it a bit easier for uh, institutions to start generating uh, some of this technical metadata and placing it in uh, preservation-oriented metadata standards that will be of uh, value and use to libraries um, who are looking to reposit these objects in uh, their institutional repositories. Um, so we document some usage around some open source tools uh, related to that as well. Um, and then uh, the very last uh, deliverable that we focused on is a, um, a wholly new piece of software. Um, it's an ETD submission system that is focused on uh, a simple submission for ETDs and uh, the gathering of some very lightweight metadata. It's meant to fill some of those use cases where an institution is perhaps not quite sold on what it is that they should be making use of long term for their submission system. Um, but it will get them up off the ground and uh, help them to begin making use of uh, or accepting uh, ETDs and, um, and uh, moving them forward onward to the institutional repository. Um, I can actually, if the computer will let me here, I can demonstrate um, the submission system. So as I, as I said, this is a, oh, it's not showing here. Let's see if we can do this real quick. Actually, let me go ahead and save this to the very end, um, and that way I don't lose my presentation and we can, we can circle back around to it. <clears throat> Might have done that already. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So yeah, I'll, I'll demo the piece of software um, that I think would be of interest to a number of institutions here in the room who um, maybe perhaps are, as uh, I've sort of uh, gauged over the course of the morning here, at very early stages in uh, the process of implementing their ETD program. Um, this is, again, a very lightweight submission system that may not be something that an institution adopts and makes use of for the long term, uh, but gets them into the business of acquiring ETDs very quickly um, as they make later longer term decisions going forward. Okay, we've also, as I mentioned, have an accompanying workshop which provides orienta orientation and usage uh, instructions for both the guidance uh, documents and the lifecycle management tools. Um, I just spent the morning along with Gail um, carrying out the workshop as a pre-conference for, uh, for this event and we're very thankful for all those who took some time out to attend that. Um, this was actually our third time deploying the workshop and uh, from all the feedback that uh, we've gotten over the course of deploying uh, the workshop, it's been hugely successful. Um, our intention, as I'll you know, wrap up here in just a minute, is to make these um, materials available for institutions to deliver at their home institution um, or in the context of a regional association. <laughs> but we cover um, the usage of a life cycle for uh, both the documents, the life cycle management tools, and you know, just orientation um, and overview for life cycle management concepts generally as they apply to ETDs uh, within the workshop. 
Okay, so in terms of next steps, um, as I mentioned, our guidance documents are finalized. Um, we would, however, be interested in talking to institutions who have an interest in perhaps translating them. Uh, they are uh, Creative Commons licensed. They're freely available for institutions to adapt um, and build upon. Um, if anyone's interested in, you know, perhaps engaging in that process, um, I can't guarantee that Educopia Institute would be able to help directly with the translation. Um, but we'd be interested in promoting that set of work uh, that any institution might uh, be interested in engaging in. Um, and then there was some promising talk within the workshop about uh, hosting some new online versions of these documents and perhaps coupling them with um, uh, some of the, the, um, uh, the annotation software that is starting to, to come into the fore for institutions so that you know you could go ahead and annotate pieces of the the documents and bring them up to date and people you know could could, could track some of those updates over time um, so that's very interesting and we're completely open to that um, we'll be making some final updates to the lifecycle management tools manual um, we would desperately love to have some more hands-on testing of these technologies that we've documented and developed um, we uh, we've made this part of a uh, so in requesting the manual, we have a built-in sort of survey process where we gather a little bit of information about um, how it is that you would, you would like to use these technologies and once you've taken some time out to test them, we follow up with you and find out what that process was like and that directly feeds back into improving both our documentation and, and uh, the, um, the code that we've developed. Um, just this morning I was talking with Peter uh, Burnhill um, and it's actually looking a bit promising to start incorporating some of his work that he's going to talk about on Friday. Everybody should stick around through Friday and, and catch uh, Peter's presentation on Hyperlink, um, which, is a, which is a great you know, uh, suite of technologies, really, as I understand it, um, that are going to be addressing uh, the issue of reference rot. And Peter's very open and interested in um, you know, having us sort of interlink that set of developments with uh, these lifecycle management tools. They really go hand in hand in a lot of ways and uh, they fill a bit of a gap uh, in many respects where we've developed a lot of tools that are of use and importance at the front end of um, the process of managing and curating ETDs. Uh, his set of technologies will come in very nicely um, uh, from really the archiving to the access. What's that? Yes, oh yes, and be sure to check out uh, Peter's poster in the back there. Uh, and then of course the workshop, as I mentioned, our goal is to Creative Commons license uh, the materials so that others can do exactly what I did this morning uh, and host a similar workshop for their institution or for their uh, regional association. Um, we will be providing a bit of uh, an instructor's manual and all of the corresponding training materials and handouts that we've made use of in the workshop will be available for, for other institutions to make use of. <laughs> Okay, so as James ended on some future research, I'll mention a few things that are, um, are, uh, uh, are shaping up to be a bit of a follow-on, if, if we're lucky, uh, to this project. Um, we have proposed uh, an additional uh, research project that would run uh, from October uh, through September of 2016 uh, to focus a bit more attention on these supplemental files and complex objects that are accompanying ETD submissions. And what we have proposed to do to you know, really start to wade into these waters um, is to address strictly student research. So we know there's a lot of um, complexity and a lot of you know, buzz and interest around uh, faculty uh, research and big data and whatnot. Um, because uh, we feel that uh, the, the resources that would be required to, to dive into that uh, set of research would be substantial, um, we do feel like we can make the case to start dipping into that from a bit of a, a side direction and just focusing on this student research. We know that it's increasing. Uh, Gabrielle uh, Michalak uh, talked a bit about how that's, um, that's coming into being for Carnegie Mellon University. Um, and we're proposing a bit of a similar model to what we've carried out in this current uh, ETD grant. Uh, we're focusing on producing a set of guidance briefs for both libraries and graduate schools and, uh, and student uh, authors on uh, actions that they can take to uh, prepare their content um, to preserve it in, in uh, viable formats and, uh, and perform various curation tasks over it um, prior to its submission. Um, so that uh, institutions have a bit more to work with uh, as, as those sorts of submissions move forward. 
Um, and then uh, curation workbench, we envision this to be a bit of a sort of a test bed uh, area where both uh, libraries, um, the graduate schools to the degree that they might be interested, and, um, and student researchers can actually step in and start to get <coughs> oriented to the technologies that, um, that should be there and in operation on behalf of their content. Um, and we would hope that, that that bit of a test bed would serve as a springboard for further technology uh, development and workflow improvement um, at the institutional level. Um, and then again, a training workshop that does very much the same as uh, what I was able to do uh, here at this event, sort of orient people to the documentation and um, provide some demonstrations of the technologies. So these are our contacts here. Um, folks uh, should feel encouraged to get in touch with me, touch base with Gail. Um, Martin Halbert and Catherine Skinner are the, the PIs on this project. Uh, you can always feel free to reach out to them. Uh, we have our project uh, wiki at metaarchive.org slash IMLS. And uh, all of our uh, manuals, documentation, everything can be found there. It's all linked and um, we would encourage folks to, to drop in to gather a little bit more information. Thank you. <laughs> so I think we can, uh, be <laughs> no applause is necessary. Um, we do have some time, I believe, we're actually well ahead of schedule. Um, we do have some time for some questions if you have any for me, um, uh, but we've also got time to follow up on some questions uh, for Gail and for James. <clears throat> hey Matt, thanks for the great presentation and for the very uh, valuable workshop this morning. Sure. I was curious about the new project <laughs> with regard to research data curation. Um, yeah. And if you've already assessed the research data management landscape, what you think the scope of the advice or the guidance in your, con in your project's context is considering that most, um, most authoritative groups are really considering that a review of data, um, research data needs to be performed by domain embedded or domain knowledgeable people so that people in astronomy should be, there should be a data scientist or an informaticist or some kind of information intermediary. Um, and so when you start expecting that research data is going to be reviewed more similarly to research articles, um, whereas ETDs tend to be, the ETDs tend to be um, reviewed by the faculty committee Mm -hmm. So are you expecting them to be the peer reviewers or the, the, the reviewers of the data set? Are you, are, you, That's are you looking at expanding the role of the advisory committee of, this, of the dissertation author to I think take on that role? Or are you, I don't know how far down the road sure. you are with this, but I'm just curious, is this something you think a library can handle or a graduate program, a thesis office? I think, uh, I think libraries are starting to begin to handle uh, that issue now. I know in the U.S. context anyway, there are several library hosted and driven initiatives to um, form a bit of outreach uh, to faculty in, in the disciplinary context uh, to raise awareness about uh, good data curation practices and you know, orient uh, some of those stakeholders to uh, the various technologies that they could make use of in, in that process. Um, I think what we're hoping would come of this project is a little bit um, additional research into that area and some of the complexities and what might be needed. So not to duplicate that research in any regard, but to learn from what has been accomplished already. And uh, it, I'm glad that you you raised the um, you know the faculty as a as a stakeholder. I failed to mention them in you know the list of these deliverables here that would be of value to them. Um, but yes, definitely the guidance briefs and this curation workbench that should be open for those particular individuals uh, to have access to and also you know orient themselves to the process and the, the different technologies that would be of value uh, to them. But in terms of specifics, I think that would be the goal of, you know, getting the research started, is that we have a sort of dedicated, um, you know, time and process for evaluating uh, what's existing now and is repurposable to, you know, sort of uh, speak to these different specific stakeholders. I think the, 
Um, my understanding is that uh, there's a lot of traction that's being gained on faculty research and student research is, you know, um, is not given, being given the same amount of attention. But uh, the, I think my, con my concern reflects mm -hmm. the reality that while the dissertation or the thesis is the student's own work, the underlying data is often that's not the case. That okay. there's more collaborative and partnership, mm -hmm. partnered ownership, because it's oftentimes the faculty advisor right. that's the PI of the, especially in the case of a funded project. Sure. And that the graduate student's data isn't really his or hers. It's part of a larger context. So I was just curious where you were thinking about in that direction. Um, yeah, I, think well, that, well, I think the model around the research data, I agree with the comments that were made in the earlier plenary session, yeah. where you want to start looking at research data practice and move away from ETD-based paradigm. That could, because, be, that could very well be the case. Because I think yeah. the stakeholders mm -hmm. in the underlying IP or the underlying research data underlying the thesis or the, the um, dissertation, mm -hmm. I think a lot of the premises we make surrounding the ETD narrative itself change yeah. with the research data. So I would... With, with that in mind and, and um, you know, it being a perfectly timed and, and enlightening, you know, set of comments, Gail, I think we, um, we'd be well served to go into that research, you know, looking to, to understand those uh, those connections and how institutions like Carnegie Mellon University are, are starting to draw those same sort of conclusions and, and move in those directions and having the project uh, be able to document that um, would be a compelling you know, uh, set of contributions, I think. Yeah. Go ahead, Peter. Yeah. Um, I could <laughs> stay on a similar theme and broaden it out. But, mm -hmm. um, I'd like to bring your attention to a project called Prolida. I don't know if you've come across Prolida, that. Prolida, no. Prolida. It's a European Union funded project and okay. it's about the preservation of linked data. Okay. So I make the reference to linked data because if we get into research data and complex da digital objects, often we're very, very interested in, in metadata about the relationships between mm -hmm. things which are intrinsically well, they're related, but they are different. And so it brings out the point that you were making before that the research data that someone was working on, mm -hmm. it isn't internal to their study, it's somewhere out there. Right. And the relationships be built on that. And I'd like to sort of add partly onto that to um, do a bit of John the Baptist for Peter Murray Rust, who's turning up tomorrow, who okay. undoubtedly will say, if only your theses were not PDFs, but were XML. Right. So, so the reason that one thing you're going to see on Peter's uh, slides tomorrow an incredible outlier, uh, which I once will. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but in terms of XML, um, the, this wasn't mentioned much in the previous. So, it, partly I, my question is to you, but partly also to some of the previous speakers about the questions they asked in their surveys. Was you know we had lots of PDFs there, mm -hmm. but to what extent was there? recognition that part of the job of a repository manager is to make that stuff computational. Right. In other words, to raise and to identify where this structured metadata is as well as the analysis of the text mining. Right. At the moment with a PDF, we encapsulate it all with fixity, but we also don't really know how to handle the metadata where to put it. Right. But as soon as you move into XML, you are required to say this is where this element is. Right. And that seems to be absent from some of the format discussions that you've been addressing and yeah. so have the previous speakers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think, uh, well, I'm definitely looking forward to uh, tomorrow's presentations and Friday's presentations. Um, this conference seems to have a really good focus on getting teeth into some of these issues of um, treating ETDs as data, um, which I think is a, is a good move. Um, you know, I think in some ways that I'm seeing this reflected in our project and, uh, and even in some of the questions that get asked and the level of responses that you hear back on some of these surveys, this is a community that in some ways is putting the cart before the horse. I mean, we're really looking out ahead um, to how to grapple with some of these issues before a lot of the institutions are even at the point of, you know, marshalling the resources and the expertise to getting up underneath some of those problems, which is which can be a really good thing. Um, 
you know, I think it just means that everybody here needs to get moving very quickly to start diving into, you know, some of these issues. Uh, and uh, one thing that occurs to me that, I mean, uh, certainly as everybody moves on from this conference, I would be very interested uh, in finding out ways of, you know, sort of um, interlinking this community with some of the research data conferences that are taking place. Um, it's obvious that, I mean, if, if, if we're really on the cusp of starting to uh, dive into some of these problems in some hands-on ways, the ETD program community would benefit greatly from all of the progress and advances and lessons learned that those different communities um, have accomplished. So that's, that's, I guess, all I'll say about that, just acknowledge and... Uh, Yeah. Oh, was I? You, you asked, you, I think you were inviting questions in this question oh, time yes. of yes. the other speakers. So what I would like to know is in the different surveys that were done, yes. to what extent is there any knowledge coming back about how far some of these uh, ETDs are held in XML format or whether it's on the to-do list to convert them from PDFs. That into is a XML. question to all of you. I won't speak to it. Maybe James and Gail can can address it. <clears throat> well, I can say it's not. <laughs> is it on now? Okay, good. <laughs> so I, I can say that uh, at least from the Amical perspective, they're not thinking about that. Uh, those that have uh, ETD programs, in many cases, feel like they're done. They're collecting PDFs, they're online, and that's, that's an ETD program. Uh, many of them aren't really even collecting supplemental files or have any, would have any idea what to do with a supplemental file if it came, came to them. Uh, I mean, these guys are still collecting uh, the file through, uh, you know, it's being brought to them on a CD. Uh, so, no, they're not thinking about that. And those that are planning, uh, just now in the midst of planning, um, really don't have the technical expertise to know, to even think about that. Mm -hmm. so, so, this community is still extremely relevant. Um, as far as, I mean, we, we've pushed, let's move to an ETD program and people are there getting there and people are going there, um, but they have a, a rudimentary understanding of what it could be and what it should be. Mm -hmm. I just, okay. wanted, yeah. just wanted to mention that 6% of those who responded to the survey said that they had XML file formats. So is there a, que a specific question you'd like us to ask on the survey other than what file formats people are using, have in their ETD repositories? Okay. <laughs> About that from a UK perspective. So um, I'm Metadata Manager for Ethos and we harvest over a hundred. Sorry, can everyone hear me? Um, she was talking about a new service that they've just launched, which would allow you to link any uh, citations in a thesis to articles in EPMC, if you could provide those citations. If it was an XML format, that would be easy to do, but because they're yep. PDFs, it's not. So we really do need to look at this issue. Mm -hmm. Well, if we, um, we, we are, you know, just a few minutes from our time to, to break here, and uh, what I thought I could do is just real quick demonstrate uh, one of the uh, technology pieces that uh, we developed from, from the ground up in the project. Much of the, the technical work that we did in our project was really to review existing 
uh, open source software solutions that uh, could be pointed at various intervals in the ETD uh, workflow process to improve uh, the curation capacity of, of ETD programs. Um, one of the, the early things that was recognized going into the project is that the landscape of um, institutional repository or submission systems uh, is quite varied. Um, there's a fairly healthy mixture, I guess you could say, um, between uh, commercial software products and, uh, and open source, you know, well-maintained uh, systems. So DSpace, ePrints, uh, OpenETD, um, those are all great examples. Virio um, are all really great examples of uh, software systems that institutions can get their hands on at low cost, and as long as they've got uh, some technical capacity, uh, they have the ability to host those systems to help facilitate uh, some of their ETD submission workflows. There are some institutions that are out there that, um, you know, I, I've talked with, with several people in the context of our workshops, they get a little bit sort of paralyzed at this point of trying to decide between an open source system and a commercial system. All of the, the systems out there are, are wonderful systems. They do sort of present themselves as something that's going to need to be adopted and nurtured and, um, you know, maintained for some period of time, so it's an investment decision um, that you're ma making around, uh, around that uh, particular software choice. Um, what we stepped in to propose was a very lightweight uh, software system uh, that would very simply accept an ETD submission, including supp supplemental files, and add a very base level of metadata, um, and do this all in a very open source fashion, uh, do it all in a very lightweight uh, software development fashion. Um, this application does not have a database backend. Um, it basically just deposits data onto a file system, so you don't have to worry about database configurations or database management. Um, and uh, packages the submission in such a way that we hope will enhance it with some preservation value for later stages of uh, the ETD submission and the various uh, overall program workflows. So what I'd like to do is just sort of walk through this very quickly. Um, it'll only take a few minutes, and uh, folks can feel free to follow up with me if they've got any questions. Um, if you request our Lifecycle Tools manual, uh, it links to our GitHub repository where this is immediately available. All of the code is completely exposed. Um, it's uh, developed in a Python Django framework. Um, so if you have developers who are sort of Python gurus in your institution, uh, they can hack at this to their heart's content and do whatever they wish or whatever you would have them wish um, to deploy it at your institution. But it's very simple and easy to, to run and maintain. Watch it blow up on me. Okay, so right at the very top, uh, it's just asking for us to submit our PDF file. You do that. If you have some supplemental data, uh, at the present moment, uh, we're accepting uh, multimedia files, complex objects that might accompany the ETD submission in a zip package. Uh, just makes it easier for the upload. That's something that could be decoupled, um, depending on what your resources are for managing large file uploads. If you have a license agreement that, you know, the student needed to sign uh, separately and include with the submission, they can do so. Supply your title. Please don't take me to task for <laughs> how these do or do not map to discipline. <clears throat> Say August. have to acknowledge that everything that you're supplying, the, the form is complete uh, to the requirements of the submission. And hit upload, and immediately it generates a unique identifier um, based on the date and the exact time of the submission and whatever your username is for the system. Uh, there were some interesting questions about um, you know, linking this up with a single uh, sign-on uh, software. 
And again, my encouragement was to uh, point some of your technical people at your institution to the code base and um, you know, feel free to communicate back to us uh, what you uh, determine would be that sort of interoperability. Um, we'd be happy to consult on it and folks are, are definitely free to uh, develop it in those directions. Um, but once the submission is in hand, the, you, can, you can engineer the application to send a mail to the student submitter as well, as long as that's logged uh, you know, at the point of uh, account creation. Um, but from an administrator's perspective, uh, you can immediately review the PDF, make sure it conforms to the various uh, formats, um, acknowledging that this is you know, in a browser window. So um, you may need to download the actual document and open it up. Uh, in whatever uh, reader software you use to evaluate the, the format of the, the PDF itself. Oops, I just need to go back here. I can. Okay. Um, in addition to the file, uh, you have some JSON that represents the form submission. Uh, this is all information that can be used to uh, programmatically retrieve um, the submission by um, external software. It also has an XML representation of the, the form metadata uh, that could be uh, crosswalked over into ET ETDMS or however you need to sort of enrich the metadata capture for uh, your repository's policies. Um, and then, as I mentioned, our hope is that this tool will encourage institutions to start thinking of these ETD submissions as um, preservation objects. Um, so what we've decided to do is uh, um, uh, implement the Bagot specification for the entire submission. Uh, so what this does immediately is it uh, wraps the submission uh, in the Bagot profile and uh, creates a set of individual checksums on a profile basis for each object. Um, and a, in a corresponding inventory. So if your uh, institutional repository, your library retrieved this data uh, from the source location where the, all of this has taken place, um, they can immediately validate that that transfer didn't in any way, shape, or form lead to some corruption of the actual content objects. Uh, so we know that things are very distributed across an ETD program's workflows. Um, I imagine a next step of this, next iteration of this, uh, would be to uh, apply some virus checking software immediately to the submission um, and have some sort of report that carries along with uh, the, the content. And that way you have you know, all of the assurances that we've really sort of put our finger on in the context of this project. Um, again, recognizing that these ETD submissions are landing at one location and being sort of shuffled around uh, throughout the course of the institution. So um, again, feel free to request the manual. It links directly to our GitHub repository. Um, there is, if, for those folks who are familiar with, um, uh, with GitHub, there's a, sort of an extension called Read the Docs, which is a nice sort of human formatted, um, human readable uh, iteration of the, um, all of the, the readmes and documentation that uh, is accompanied with the, the scripts. Um, so yeah, feel free, <laughs> play around. So um, we're right at time here. Um, again, if folks have any other sort of further questions about this or would like to talk a little bit about um, you know, how to take the next step and give it a try, um, see if it's a good fit for your institution or have any questions about the other technologies, feel free to, to talk with me.